In this video, we're going to look at rate laws. And what a rate law is, it's an equation that relates rate to the concentration of the reactants. And what we're going to learn is that, um, and this sort of makes subjective sense, when you, if you increase the amount of reactants you have around, meaning if you add more and more reactants to a reaction and then you sort of set it off, um, the, more reactions, the more reactants you have around, the faster the reaction will go. And this kind of makes subjective sense because the more concentrated something is, the more likely it is to interact with the other reactants and those interactions are going to allow it to start to combine and go to products. So basically what we know is that there, as you increase the concentration of reactants, this is going to lead to an increase in rate. So it makes sense that there's a relationship between concentration and rate. And the general expression for this, so if you look at this equation that we have, we have A of A plus B of B goes to products. Where A is some reactant, it doesn't matter, it's just, just a general, this is just a general expression. So A is some reactant and B is some other reactant and they're combining together to give us some products. And you'll notice that the little a and the little b are coefficients. So the little a in this case would be, for example, let's say that we had 1a plus 2b goes to products. So we're just putting in a little placeholder for the coefficients, which is uh, these little a's and these little b's. Now what we're going to find out is that in terms of the rate laws, those little a's and little b's make no difference. So that's why I'm kind of calling them out, because I want to show you that in when we write the rate law, you'll never see the little a and the little b. All you'll see is the big A and the big B, which is the actual reactants themselves. For any given equation, there's a singular procedure for writing a general rate law. So the general rate expression, the general rate law for any reaction is that the rate is going to equal k. And we're going to talk about what little k is in just a second. It's called the rate constant. So anytime you write it, you're always going to write a little k. Every reaction has a little k. And then you're going to take the reactants and you're going to put them in. So in this case, we have two reactants. One is little a, uh, one is big A, and one is big B. Now, in reality, these are just going to be, and you'll see this in a few seconds, these are just going to be placeholders for whatever the reactants are. If you had one reactant, then you would just put one reactant in. If you had two reactants, then you put the two reactants in in brackets. If you have three, you put all three in. It doesn't really matter. So you just take the reactants and you put them into brackets. And then we're going to have these little powers up here of M and N. So let's start to break this down and we're going to talk about what those are. Those are going to be the order of the, with respect to each reactant. And we'll explain what those mean in kind of, in a second. So let's start with the little k, which is the rate constant. Now the reason why every rate equation needs, every general rate law needs a rate constant is because this rate constant allows us to convert between the units of molar, which is the units of um, the concentrations of A and B, and the rate. And it's going to kind of depend on what's going on with these rate equations. So depending on what M and N are, will kind of change the units of what the rate constant are. But this is something that we measure experimentally, and you can kind of think of this as the slope, right? So if you have y equals mx plus b, um, in, in, the, in this case we don't have a b, we just have mx, where the slope is the same thing as k, and the x is the concentrations to their orders, right? So the x is something that you change, which in this case this is exactly what we're doing. We have the initial concentrations, uh, or we have the concentrations of our reactants, and we, can, we set that when we start our reaction. You basically, in any given reaction, you, you start it by controlling how, many, how much reactants you give it. And then uh, K is the slope, and that tells you how fast the reaction is going, to be, is going to be going. That's like the slope. So the rate constant, you can think of that as kind of like a slope. And then we have M and N. And M and N stand for the orders with respect to a reactant. So for example, M is the order with respect to A, and N is the order with respect to B. And what this basically tells you, what M and N tells you, is how important is that reactant in terms of determining the rate. So if the number is very low, then it doesn't matter very much at all. If the number is relatively high, then it matters quite a bit, because it means that we're raising it to that power. So the higher the power is, the more significant that 
A is going to be in controlling the rate. So what are the possible numbers, right? So I said low and high. Well, typically these can be either 0, 1, or 2 in general chemistry. And there's also the possibility for a half. So you could also have 0 0.5 or 1.5. 1 1.5 uh, being much less common than 0 0.5. So you can have either whole number orders of 0, 1, or 2, and half orders of 0 0.5 or 1.5. So that's a possible, no, that's a possible value. Those are the possible values for, for an M or an N. Now, if you look at the 0, for example, so if we were to have M was equal to 0, well, in that case, if you take anything to the 0 power, it turns out that that just becomes a 1. Meaning, so if you take A to the 0 power, or anything to the 0 power, it becomes a one. So that means that if you have something that's zero order, the concentration of that reactant makes absolutely no difference with respect to the rate at all, because it just gets factored out completely. If something has a one or a two, then that means that you take a to the one or a to the two, so that a is gonna have a difference on the rate, and it just depends, the bigger the number, the more significant that controls, the more significant that reactant is in controlling the rate. So that's how you can think of order with respect to um, a reactant. And then we have the overall order. So we have M plus N in this case, which would be the overall order. And that is the quote unquote reaction order. And that tells you what overall order the, the entire reaction is itself. So for example, in this case, if we had a M was equal to one and an N is equal to one, then the overall order for that reaction would be a second order reaction. That's kind of the nomenclature. So now let's take a look at some examples because I think this is gonna start to help you understand what's going on here. And really what this turns out to be is basically if you can write this general rate law for anything, you have exactly what you need to, to, to know um, it just becomes a matter of getting information about M and N, and that's something that we have to determine experimentally, and the same thing for K. So what we're going to see when we do the method of initial rates, we're going to use the method of initial rates to determine M, N, and K experimentally. Okay, so here's a slide where we have some examples of um, some things. So if we look, let's just take a look at the first line here. We have N2O5, and that's our only reactant. So if I was going to write a general rate law, my general rate law for this one would be rate is equal to K times N2O5 to the M. And at that point, I would stop because I don't have any more information about K or M. You would have to either do some kind of experiment or we would have to tell you that M was, for example, uh, a 1, meaning that uh, the N2O5 was first order. So in this case, we tell you that. So we say that the reactant order is one for the N2O5. So then we substitute a one up here based on the information I gave you here, and then you put it in. Now, when you have a one, anything to the one power is just itself. So N2O5 to the first power is itself. So built into this N2O5, there's a one up here. It's just not explicitly written. So whenever you see just the concentration of N2O5 with no superscript, that just means that it's just to the first order. Um, it's, it's in there and it's assumed, but it may not be explicitly written. Um, and now, so in this case, because there's only one reactant and we know it's to the first order, the overall reaction order is going to be a 1. Now let's look at the CO plus NO2 case. And actually there's a little teeny tiny mistake here. This should just be NO over here on the right. So you can delete that that little two. Now again, if I were to write a general rate equation for this, uh, my general rate equation would be rate is equal to K times CO to the M times NO2 to the N. And that would be the, the furthest I could go unless I knew something about it. Well, in this case, we're giving you the rate equation. So it's actually given here. And now we have to interpret that that rate equation. And so like I said, if there's just the reactant written and there's no superscript, you can assume that there are little ones there because anything to the one power is just itself. So then we know from the way that that rate law is written that this is a one and this is a one. So that's what we know. Um, and now if we want to figure out the overall order, we take M plus N and that's going to give us two for the reaction order there. 
Now let's look at the next one. So the next one we have CH3Cl2. And you might start to you might be tempted to think that because there's a one and a one here as our coefficients, that CH Cl3 and Cl2 should be one and one. Well they're not, because this little a and this little b do not have any impact on the orders themselves. It, it could potentially be the same, but it, it's not always going to be the same. So what we see here is that this little guy, based on the way the rate law is written, is going to be a 1, and this one's going to be a 1 half. So we have a 1 and a 1 half or 0 0.5. And I'm, we're okay with you writing it either way. It could be a 1, uh, a 1 half or a 0 0.5 just like that, and that would be fine. So the overall order in this case is going to be a 1.5. We add the 1 and the 0.5 together. Now here's a good example of one where we have to actually write the rate equation. So here we have rate is going to equal K times the concentration of HBr, that's my first reactant, to the M times my concentration of O2 to the N. So I write it generally first and then I go looking for more information. Well in this case it tells me that my HBr and my O2 are 1 and 1. So let me just rewrite this guy here. So now that I know that my HBr and my um, O2 are to the 1 and to the 1, I can just leave them as concentration of HBr and the concentration of O2. And I don't have to put the 1s because it's, Im it's implied that they're there. And so again, my overall order is going to be a 2. So now let's look at one where we have a, zero, a 0th order, and I'll show you how I figured that out in just a second. So this is another good example. In some cases, a reaction can be have one rate law depending on a certain set of conditions, and it can the same reaction, depending on a different set of conditions, might have a different rate law. So you know it it depends on what's going on in the setup. Like for example, this one might have a enzyme that's or a catalyst that's um, running the reaction, and the other one. Um, may not have a catalyst that's running the reaction. So um, it, these rate laws kind of depend on what's going on a little bit. So the general rate equation is going to be K times the concentration of CO times the concentration of NO2. Now let's look at the information that's given. So this one says that NO2 is a, has a power of 2. So I'm going to write that in automatically because it, it says it. But this is interesting. It says that the NO2 has an order of 2 and the overall order is 2. So what do we do with the order for CO? Well, if M plus N has to equal 2 and M is equal to 2, what, I, uh, what is the N going to be then? And in this case, if you solve this algebraic expression, N must therefore equal 0. So my order for CO is going to be a 0. So if we put that up here, the question is, is, is that how we're going to leave it? Do we leave it to CO to the 0th power? Well, we don't, because what you have to remember is anything to the zeroth power becomes a 1. So CO to the zeroth power is really just a 1. So it turns out that the CO goes away, and the proper rate equation for this is going to be rate is equal to K times NO2 squared, and the CO is not even in there, because the CO goes to the zeroth power, and then it goes away because it becomes a 1. So if you see a rate equation, if you see a rate law, and one of the one of the reactants is missing then you know that that reactant is to the zeroth power so now these two concept questions down at the bottom these boil down to just understanding that a and b have no the little a and little b have no effect on the rate law so if we look can you determine the order of a reactant from the stoichiometry of the reaction well let's take a look at this one right so if the stoichiometry of the reaction made a difference then the 4 for the HBr would be the order, and the 1 would be for the O2. Well, now it turns out that the 1 for the O2 does make sense, but the HBr does not get the 4 uh, that is the stoichiometric coefficient. So the answer is no. We can't use the stoichiometry from the reaction to determine the order of a reactant. And then the, the reverse question is, well, can we go in the reverse direction and figure out the stoichiometry from the rate law? And the answer is, again, no, because we have... If we were to just look at the orders, we would assume that the stoichiometry would be 1 to 1. But it turns out that the stoichiometry in this case is not. It's 4 to 1. So the answer to those concept questions is that the little a and the little b, or the coefficients, have no influence on the rate law whatsoever. Um, in some cases, they do happen to match. In other cases, they don't. And the idea, though, is that 
you know, that's something the M and N have to be determined experimentally. And we're going to see that in the next video.